Right, so um, I've been given the job of, um, of introducing um, Eduardo today. Uh, Eduardo, although he's very young, has a, a rather long and varied career. He was born and brought up here in Morelia, Michoacan, but he did his uh, undergraduate degree in the UNAM Mexico City, um, where he did a physics degree from 2012 to 2017. And while he was there, he did an undergraduate thesis with Manuel Paimbert at the Instituto de Astronomia um, in the UNAM on the subject of temperature fluctuations in planetary nebulae. And although he had left Michoacan, Michoacan had not forgotten him because in 2014, he was awarded the Premio Estatal al Merito Juvenil from uh, the Estado of Michoacan. He then went on to do a master's degree uh, in Tenerife at the Universidad de La Laguna and the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias. And there he worked on abundance gradient uh, of helium in the Milky Way, uh, working with Cesar Esteban. And currently, He's doing a PhD also at the uh, uh, ESA, the uh, Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias, um, where he's also a resident astronomer. And his thesis advisors are Cesar Esteban and Jorge Garcia Rojas. And his thesis topic is the um, photoionized Herbic Harrow objects in the Orion Nebula. And that's the topic that he will be talking about today. So uh, please go ahead, Eduardo. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, I'm glad to to be here. Well, at least it's not the same as in person, but at least I can talk to you by by Zoom. Uh, for those that may do not know me, I am Jose Eduardo Mendez Delgado, a PhD student from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias, and I'm going to talk today about the work that we make on photoionized Herbig Haro objects in the Orion Nebula. Uh, this is a series of papers of which two of them have already been published. The last one is available in the AstroPH since today. So I come here with a very, with very, very fresh news. So first of all, let me introduce the Herbie Haro objects. They are small emission nebulae associated to outflows from newly born stars. Uh, these objects are considered to be originated through a centrifugal magnetic launch mechanism from junk stellar objects, but it's not completely clear how it works. Since their discovery in the 50s by George Hedwig and Guillermo Aro, several of them have been observed and studied. Some of these objects had been found in neutral environments where the mission is powered by the released kinetic energy that heats and ionizes the gas. In fact, this is the most common idea of these objects between the community. Ejections from material from stars whose ionization has been originated in shocks. Uh, we can visualize the physical idea by thinking that the ejected material interacts with the surrounding medium in a very thin layer, which heats the gas, exciting it and ionizing it. While behind this thin layer, a cooling zone is formed, which it releases all the kinetic energy through the emission of collisional excited lines of metals and recombination lines of hydrogen and helium. It is common to find in the spectra of these Herbig Haro objects uh, in neutral environments that the emission of most ionized ions are present in the hottest areas where the shock is stronger, and then in the areas where we have um, shocks less, less stronger, less important, or in areas that have been cool, we can find emission of ions of lower ionization degree. Knowing the chemical composition of these objects is in fact very difficult because for this, we need to know the electronic density and temperature, but, we, but since they are not in equilibrium, there are several densities and various temperatures between each volume of gas emitting radiation. Uh, these jets can travel from few tens to several hundred kilometers per second. These are phenomena that evolve on the human uh, time scale. Uh, I'm going to show you a video of the evolution of the jet of HH34, an object located in the constellation of the Orion. I think we can see how it moves. The video has been made with observation of several uh, of the same object over different years. I thought it's not seen in the video. There is a fainter counterjet which emission is redshifted. Generally, it's expected 
to have bipolar outputs in, in these herbic harrow objects. So if these objects are formed in young stars, one will expect that there will be a large number of these objects in H2 regions where there are many star formings and indeed this happens. Uh, multiple jets of gas can be found traveling through the gas of the Orion Nebula, but here there is a significant difference. The stars of the Orion trapezium generate a very strong radiation field capable of ionize the surrounding gas with their emission of photons. This radiation field, it's also able to photoionize the gas of the herbic harrow objects. And then the shock between the ambient gas and the herbic harrow merely serves to create a dense blow uh, where we can apply the standard methods to derive physical conditions and chemical abundances in ionized nebula. Uh, when the photoionization equilibrium dominates, the gas maintains a fixed temperature by heating by photoionization and cooling from the emission of lines and free free radiation. The radiation field of the Orion Nebula, it is strong enough so that energy input from the shock, it's very small and in most, most cases is negligible. Here, I want to show you a GIF that we made of HH 529 with images of the uh, Hubble Space Telescope taken in the central area of the Orion Nebula over 20 years. I thought the jet, main, uh, the jet mainly moves from east to west there are some other gas interactions that are moving in other directions. In fact, it is pretty common to find several jets and several uh, uh, interactions of gas around the central part of the high region of the Orion Nebula. So the next questions are, why do we study the Herbie Harrow objects in the Orion Nebula? What are we gonna get? And we want to know first, the physical conditions and the ionic composition of these objects. The relationship of these properties with the geometry, kinematics, and dynamics of the gas. We want to understand the origin of these herbic harrow objects and their relationship to areas of high star formations in the Orion Nebula, such as Orion South. We also want to study the global impact of these shocks on the photoionized gas. In particular, we are interested in the dust destruction process. And we will do this by studying these regions in as much detail as possible, analyzing effects that have a major impact, not only in herbic harrow objects, but on ionized nebulae in general. The standard way to analyze the chemical composition of an ionized nebula is first to determine the physical conditions of temperature and density. We made this by measuring some intensity lines and made the ratios that are sensitive to these quantities. And then with the intensity of the emission of the ions, we can calculate their abundance by solving the equations of a statistical equilibrium uh, with the temperature and the density that we obtain. The detailed knowledge of this, uh, of the physics of the photoionized regions is important uh, since it's the basis, for example, of many relationships that make it possible to determine the chemical compositions of galaxies, metallicities, and other physical properties, not only in our field of, of study. But there are still many problems to solve that can have an important impact on the physical interpretations that we make of the universe. For example, that, uh, that problem that exists between uh, the discrepancy between the abundances obtained uh, from the same ion with the intensity of collisional excited emission lines and those uh, lines that comes from electronic recombination or the discrepancy between the chemical abundances obtained uh, from the stars of H2 regions and those obtained from the surrounding gas. This can indicate the existence of physical phenomena such as temperature fluctuation, lumps of different chemical composition, unexplored recombination process at the atomic levels commonly populated by collisions and along the street, et cetera. So we want to know what happens uh, with these problems in these Herbie Caro objects uh, that are formed with gas ejection from, uh, from stars or from the Orion Nebula. They are like an intermediate state between the stellar and the nebular matter. These objects are ideal laboratories where we can test our methods to derive chemical abundances. With these, uh, with these objects, use geometry, it's observable and uh, which have the same 
chemical composition as the Orion Nebula under different physical and ionization conditions, we seek to understand the physics of the interstellar medium. We base then our work on deep high spectral resolution spectroscopy of UVs at the very large telescope and high spatial resolution imaging from the Hubble Space Spatial Telescope. Uh, we are able to solve the different kinematic components that are present in the gas. Here, uh, I show a beautiful image of the HST of the Orion Nebula that show many Herbicard objects. Uh, on the left side, side, there are visible those that emit mainly in low ionization degree, and from the left and the right side, there are visible some others that are emitting in high ionization degree. I think I, I cannot use the, the mouse here, but I, I'm going to show you. For example, here we can uh, find HH204, HH203, HH202, that are mainly uh, emitting in low ionization degree. And then if we uh, use the filter of the oxygen-3-5007, uh, uh, we can see that almost uh, these shocks disappear because they are almost emitting all the radiation in low ionization degree, but then some other appears as this one that is HH529. So we have a rich uh, environment of different uh, uh, physical conditions uh, achieved by these, by these shocks. So this is actually uh, a, a realistic image of what we will expect of any H2 region, several gas interactions. This is a quite different image from the sphere of Strongram that is shown at the center, that is our spherical cow in ionized nebula. Eduardo, yeah. um, in, in Keynote, you can turn on the display of the cursor during the presentation. If you okay. go to pref, can I? Would you like to do that? Uh, I think it is not necessary anymore. I just wanted to, okay. to, to okay. show here. Okay. But, but thank you. Thank you. I'll shut up now. Um, well, well uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus mainly in H. Uh, oops, oops. Uh, <laughs> easy. Well, so in this talk, I'm going to focus mainly in H. 204 and the system HH uh, 529, 2 and 3, which are shown in these images, along with the position of our UVS slit. And also, I'm going to talk a bit about some preliminary results on HH 514. So, this is how we work with the UVS spectra. In the first image, uh, we have the position of the UVS slit we reduce the observational data in order to obtain uh, the two-dimensional spectra. Then we especially isolate the different kinematic components put in the 2D spectra. In this case, HH529-2 is in cut 2 and the 3 is in cut 3. And we finally obtain one-dimensional spectra with emission from the Herbicard object spectrally separated from the main uh, emission from the Orion Nebula due to the different radial velocity and or high spectral resolution. In HH204, in addition to the two defined cuts, we studied the pixel to pixel emission at a scale of 0 0.2 arc seconds per pixel. This allowed us to have a deep and detailed spectra with thousands and thousands of emission lines, which we were, which were carefully measured by hand uh, with the uh, S-plot task of IRAF, one by one. And an interesting thing about HH204 is that in addition to the main nebular spectrum, we detect the spectrum of the diffuse blue layer, another nebula that is uh, in the line of sight with slightly slower velocity than the Orion Nebula. So we analyze all the component, uh, we analyze all the components the results of, of the Herbicaro objects. So we can, what can we do with this rich spectrum? Well, we can do many things. Mm, we have several lines uh, whose intensity radio is highly dependent on the temperature or electronic density in the equations of statistical equilibrium. With the continuum emission in the Balmer and Fashion jumps, we can obtain the representative temperature of the uh, ionized hydrogen once we determine the characteristic physical condition of each ion, 
We can obtain the ionic abundances based on their emission lines. We detect even many of the weakest recombination lines. Therefore, we can study the problem of the abundance discrepancy. But also with the spectral position of the lines, we can determine the radial velocity of each ion in the Herrijaro objects and also in the nebula uh, components. While with the width of the lines, we can estimate the temperature uh, of, the, of the gas and or the degree of, of turbulence that it's present in, in the components. Uh, we can study uh, with the HST uh, image, we can study uh, the proper motions uh, of the Herbig Haro objects uh, over uh, using the imaging that has been taken over several years. Furthermore, we can also estimate the spatial distribution and variation in the emission of some lines. So uh, we are going to start with, I'm going to start with some results of uh, the first paper of this series. Uh, our results about uh, HH 520, uh, 529. So our study on these higher objects gives several results, but the first thing that I put here is that the contribution of the energy of the shock is small and can be neglect neglected. How do we know this? Because we calculate it. Uh, the flux contribution of the cooling zone is uh, that it's originated after the shock passage has to be equal to the kinetic energy released by the shock. Uh, on the other hand, the radiative flux of the, of the gas in equilibrium is proportional to the square of the post-shock density and by the thickness of the work surface. So once we verify that the spectrum of the Herbihado object is consistent with that of a small scale H2 region, we can study with the usual ionized nebula methods. We derive the, uh, we verify the absence of the emission lines of neutral elements and we, we found also a high degree of ionization. We were able to analyze in great detail the composition of highly ionized ions such as neon twice ionized, oxygen twice ionized, both uh, in collisional excitation lines and, and collisional excited lines and recombination lines. We show that the, the most likely scenario is that HH529-2 uh, is an internal shock from the same Herbig Haro object and not a uh, working head. As shown in the image, uh, sev uh, several uh, nodes are integrated within the UV slit. Uh, we also find that the flow angle uh, of this Herbig Haro object with respect of this uh, plane of the sky, it's around uh, 58 degrees. So it shows that a significant part of the gas from this object travels towards the, the observer. And the compression of the gas in this Herbig Haro object increased the density, which is around 30,000, about three times the density of the Orion Nebula in the surrounding areas. However, the temperature of the high and low degree of ionization ions are consistent with the values obtained in the Orion Nebula due to the photoionization equilibrium. We determine the ionic abundances of several ions, but thanks to the high degree of ionization, the abundances of helium, carbon, oxygen, chlorine, argon, and iron were obtained without any ionization correction factor. These uh, ICFs are relationship based on predictions of photoionization models or similarities between the potential, uh, the ionization potential of some ions that calculate the contribution to the total abundance of the ions whose emission is not present in the spectrum. As I put there in the question, uh, the total abundance is the sum of all the ionic abundances multiplied by these ICFs that calculate those ions that are not present in the, in the spectrum. Uh, these factors are of thought very useful. They have significant uh, uncertainties. We detect several recombination lines of carbon twice ionized, uh, neon twice ionized, and oxygen twice ionized. With, with the later, we also calculate the density that is uh, uh, that is uh, giving us this uh, the, this distribution of, of the different uh, lines of the multiplet one, and we obtain actually a very discrepantly low value. Uh, and on the other hand, we calculated. Uh, uh, we study 
the, the, the paradigm of temperature fluctuations of Spain bed. Uh, by do, uh, we did this by calculating the temperature with helium lines. And the paradigm uh, predicts that if there is small fluctuation of, of temperature in the volume of gas integrated in the line of sight, the abundances obtained with collisional excited lines will be underestimated from the real value, while the recombination lines will give uh, the real abundance given their small dependence on the temperature. Our results show that this uh, paradigm is not able to uh, explain what we observe in HH 529.2 and 3. There seems to be another phenomenon causing the abundance discrepancy. We also observe a slight overabundance in heavy elements with respect to the abundance obtained in the Orion Nebula. Although uh, the shock can destroy dust and release part of some elements to the gaseous state, this overabundance also affects some novel gases which are not depleted into dust. So uh, this may be due to an inclusion of hydrogen diffusion material from a peripheral area of the accretion disk of the source of HH529 that has been entrained uh, into the bow shock. Also, there are several studies in the infrared that show indication of this possibility. This hypothesis requi requires further analysis. So the shock uh, passage, it's able to destroy those cranes and these grains with high content of iron and nickel uh, give us an increase of a factor of uh, 2.35 with respect to the abundance obtained in the Orion Nebula. It is interesting to analyze the level of dust destruction in each object to know what factors favor this process, such as the flow velocity or the degree of ionization. I forgot to, to play a bit the, the GIF. Well, this is a GIF that also we made with uh, the images of HH529 uh, with different uh, observations. So now I want to move to HH204. So let's start with the physical conditions. Uh, this object is located in the southeast of the Orion, uh, of the Orion bar near to theta 2 or A in the scanner uh, plane. In this case, in addition to the analysis similar to that done on HH529, we study the emission of HH204 pixel by pixel at the scale of 0.2 arc seconds. We find a steady increase of density when we approach to the bow shock, reaching values of around 20,000, higher than the nebular values that are of the order of, uh, of 1,000 in the position of our slit. Pixel by pixel, we derive also the temperature with nitrogen lines and with sulfur lines that are approximately constant around 9,000 Kelvin. Since these ions are representative of the low and intermediate ionization stage, uh, this implies that they are in photoionization equilibrium. However, uh, something that is very interesting is that the temperature of oxygen screen that is representative of the ions of high degree of ionization shows a prominent gradient. This extraordinary behavior in the, of the forbidden O3 emission can also be detected with the HST images. A narrow border of high gradio between O3 and H alpha can be observed. The interpretation of these results is based on the contribution of the different layers of HH204. The shock dissipates the kinetic energy that hits the gas and forms a cooling zone out of the ionization equilibrium. The length of, of this cooling layer is inversely proportional to the density and in our case is very thin since we have uh, high densities. In, in the, then the, in the gas cools down and reaches the temperature equilibrium in the back layer and in the jet. These last two zones, which already achieved the photoionization equilibrium, essentially contain ions with low or intermediate degree of ionization. Therefore, any emission from the cooling zone of ions such as oxygen once ionized is negligible with respect to the contribution of the layers that are in photoionization equilibrium. However, the emission of the high, highly ionized ions basically only comes from the cooling zone. But we don't have to be scared about the shock. Its global contribution is also negligible. We have estimated that the proportion of gas with high degree of ionization is less than 1%. Uh, we have been able 
to determine the temperature of oxygen three and the abundances of oxygen twice ionized it due to the deepness of our spectra, but their emission is rather very faint. As we can see, the abundance of uh, oxygen twice ionized is at least 2.8 dex less than uh, that of oxygen uh, plus. So basically all the oxygen is uh, that, is, that it's ionized is in oxygen plus, uh, plus phase. And what about the ionic abundances of other elements? Here we present the distribution of the ones and twice ionized chlorine, sulfur, iron, and nickel ions. At closer distances to the bow shock, the density is very high and the degree of ionization is basically zero. In these areas, the possible contribution of ions three or more times ionized to the total abundance is negligible. In fact, it is possible to see the relative increase of the abundances of the ions once ionized as the ionic abundances of once and twice uh, ionized ions get stabilized say, at distances of approximately five milliparsec from the bow shock, uh, the contribution of ions three or more times ionized are zero. And we can calculate the total abundance of these uh, elements without ICS with the greatest detail as possible. Uh, we, we have been able to do this with oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, sulfur, nickel, and iron. In fact, we also show that the iron and nickel have similar ionization and depletion patterns, which allow us to calculate the abundance of both elements by determining only one of them. On the other hand, the emission of argon twice ionized and helium ionized follow similar patterns. At closer distances to the bow shock, the density increases and the degree of ionization decreases. So the abundance of these ions decrease and instead the abundance of argon once ionized and into uh, helium should increase. In the case of uh, nitrogen once ionized, the distances close to the bow uh, at distances close to the bow shock, the low degree of ionization lowers the contribution of nitrogen plus plus to zero. And what about the abundance discrepancy problem? Well, we study this problem with oxygen once ionized lines, and we don't have this problem, at least with oxygen. Uh, both the recombination lines and the collisional excited lines provide the same value, like what happens in practical all the ionized nebula. There are several factors that may be key on this. Our detailed study reveals that there are no significant temperatures in homogeneities for the gas in equilibrium, and based on the no geometry, of the object that flows at a small angle with the plane of the sky that it's moving almost uh, in the plane of the sky, it is likely that we are not integrating lumps of chemical inhomogeneities within the line of sight. Uh, finally, it is interesting that the majority of the studies of the uh, abundance discrepancy problem are based on oxygen twice ionized recombination lines, almost all finding um, a factor of abundance discrepancy uh, that it's uh, not zero. While from the few studies that study the combination lines of oxygen once ionized, at least this work and the one of Mesa Delgado et al. of 2009 have found a zero ADF. Maybe not all ions have the same source of ADF. So we are gonna study this problem in, in all the heavy cattle objects that we are gonna, uh, that are gonna be part of our series. And our spectra is deep enough uh, to detect also the emission of deuterium associated with the herbic Haro object. Mm, I think this is the first time that has been observed in, directly in a herbic Haro object. Uh, although there are some studies that have uh, found traces of, of, of this emission, but I think they were associated with the emission of the Orion Nebula. Uh, this is important because this emission is produced mainly by fluorescence excitation of, of the far UV continuum in, in the interface between the zones of neutral and ionized hydrogen. This indicates the, present, the presence of a trapped neutral zone traveling within the uh, herbic Haro object. Furthermore, as observed in this uh, 2D spectra, the distribution of the emission of neutral elements is quite different from that of oxygen once ionized or other ions is shielded from the back 
with each actually the di direction towards theta or one C. And this indicates that the density increases so much that the degree of ionization is so low and traps an ionization, an ionization front. Previous work that had studied the mixed spectrum of HH204 with the Orion Nebula, that is what you get when you have low spectral resolution, has suggested that the emission of neutral elements was a result of an interaction between the herbic haro object and the neutral veil of the Orion Nebula. And well, it is common to uh, interpret the presence of a strong emission of neutral elements or, or as uh, in terms of the presence of shock heating, but this is not always the case. Here we prove that actually what we have is a trap uh, ionization front. But in addition to the physical and chemical conditions, we want to know what is the origin uh, of HH204. Uh, the origin of many herbic objects have been studied in the area called Orion South within the central part of the Orion Nebula, which is rich in, in young star formation. Due to, the, to its physical proximity, it has been speculated uh, on a common origin between HH204 and HH203. However, we show that HH203 is actually a super, superposition of two gas flows with different degrees of ionization and different origins. One coming from the area near to the trapezium with high ionization degree, and the other coming from Orion South with low ionization degree. Although we do not have enough evidence to clearly define the origin of HH204, we do, we do find a flow that seems to connect it with the southern zone of the Orion South. We also show that the jet that of HH204 propagates at an angle of 32 degrees with respect of the plane of the sky. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, an issue that is important for many studies of ionized nebula, in particular for those who work with planetary nebula or high density regions, or even those that determine gal galactic metallicities by adding the emission of several H2 regions. Uh, sometimes we take for granted that the sum of the spectra of several components will give us always a spectrum from which we will obtain an average representative values of the added components. Well, this is not always the case. We know, we now explore the results that we will get if our observation had lower uh, spectral resolution, uh, low uh, reaching low or intermediate spectral resolution. We mix the, the emission of the different kinematic components uh, in our slit, HH204, the diffuse blue layer, and the main nebula emission. And then we analyze the resulting spectrum. And here I show you uh, the plasma diagnostics uh, that uh, we get from this. If we follow the classic procedure of taking the density of uh, oxygen twice ionized, uh, sulfur two and chlorine three diagnostics, we may think that they are consistent and we are uh, doing it correctly. But in fact, we will underestimate the real density because we know the, the real density of each component. And, all, and this implies an overestimation of the temperature of, uh, of nitrogen and an underestimation of the abundance of oxygen plus. This implies also an incorrect estimation of the ionization correction factors. And we basically, we are gonna obtain incorrect chemical abundances and we are not gonna be able to correctly interpret the physics that it's involved. Actually, there are uh, there's, uh, previous studies uh, of HH204 uh, that works with IFU spectra of lower spectral resolution as MUSE or PMAS. And these studies interpret the high temperature of nitrogen that they found as shock heating. However, in reality, the problem is that it is in the density estimation. In fact, the shock heating of uh, the temperature of oxygen three, which we show that it's significant in HH204, goes unnoticed in the low resolution spectra. But why these classical, classic, classical diagnostics underestimate the density of the low or intermediate resolution spectra in the first place? The sulfur-2 and the oxygen-2 diagnostics have a very low sensitivity at values higher than 10,000 
So the density of HH204 goes unnoticed. Basically, they are blind for, for it. On the other hand, a fault a chlorine 3 diagnostic has a higher sensitivity in this range of densities. The low degree of ionization of HH204 provides a little, little contribution on the total emission of chlorine lines uh, in the simulated intermediate uh, resolution spectrum. Plus, the chlorine 3 is biased to the values of the main nebular emission. So I would wait to detect the high density inclusions from the herbic object in a low resolution spectra, maybe the use of the iron three lines as density diagnostic. They will be biased uh, to the density of the herbic objects because their sensitivity is, uh, are practically nil at values lower than thousand and due to the destruction of dust in the bow shock with contain of iron, most of the iron emission will come from the herbic Haro object. And as we can see from the plasma diagnostic again, the iron three uh, density diagnostic, it seems inconsistent with the most classic ones. Sometimes the inconsistencies of the iron density diagnostic have been interpreted as failures of the atomic parameters, whether the transition probabilities or the collisional strengths and this is a, a, actually a reasonable idea given the complexity of the atom of uh, iron twice ionized uh, with so many relevant levels. And so because of, because of that, we have explored this hypothesis in our work, given the geometry of HH204 moving at small angle with respect to the plane of the sky, we do not expect to have density gradients along the line of sight since we see the jet almost transversally. Uh, Major, uh, major density changes can be resolved in the plane of the sky. Uh, we have enough spectral resolution to separate the emission of HH204 from the Orion Nebula. So we have a single gas component with a low degree of ionization and no temperature fluctuation in at least 99% of the gas. So we use the temperature and the density from various diagnostics, which were all totally consistent. And then we compare the theoretical predictions using our uh, atomic data parameters uh, and the intensities of all the observed lines, which are around 33. And with the data use, only four lines had differences greater than 10%. So the atomic data used in, in our work is actually very reliable, at least for the condition of HH204. In fact, we compare more recent atomic data sets uh, that claim to eliminate inconsistencies with other diagnostics. And they, in these data sets gave us uh, poor results. Uh, we have to be careful when we are trying to eliminate apparent inconsistencies because maybe we are losing some physical information there. So coming back as, as a conclusion on this topic, uh, we recommend to analyze all the diagnostics of the spectrum and not just adopting the consistent ones. Uh, because we could be consistently wrong, uh, but better and easier if we have high resolution spectra. And what did we do with the nebular emission? We also study, but uh, I thought I do not mention it here. Uh, there is a detailed analysis in each of the papers, uh, but something that is notorious, and I'm going to talk a bit about it, of it, is the special uh, is an special nebular component, the diffuse blue layer. I thought. It's present, uh, it is present through all this lead. Uh, we can see that it's an intermediate uh, velocity component in the emission of uh, 3729 uh, oxygen once uh, line. And I thought it's in all the all this lead, it's better uh, to study it in cut two because the contrast is better since we don't have the strong emission of HH204. So we analyze uh, this component and we found that it has a very low density in com uh, compared to that of the Orion Nebula. Uh, it is also moving at, at the speed of approximately 28 kilometers per second toward to us uh, with respect to the Orion molecular cloud. And it presents the emission of neutral elements which indicates the existence of an ionization front uh, it's emitting mainly in low ionization ions. Uh, this region, it's probably ionized by a star like theta 2 or a, 
or even it's likely to have a combination of, of photons from a cooler star as Theta 2 OEB and the Rayo Nebula. However, we need to have a energetic photons because we observe uh, oxygen three. So probably it's coming from the Rayo Nebula. So we study for the first time the chemical composition of this component. So a short summary of the HH204 results, we find that 99% of the gas is in low and intermediate degrees of ionization, where the contribution of the shock is negligible. We completely unveil HH204, finding an increase in density at shorter distances from the bow shock, while the representative temperature for the 99% of the gas was kept in equilibrium and without fluctuations. The degree of ionization is low enough to trap an, an ionization front, complementing the abundances obtaining in HH529, 2 and 3. Uh, in this object, we were able to determine the abundances of oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, sulfur, nickel, iron, and iron without an ACF. The abundances or the abundance of oxygen deserves an important discussion, since both the recombination and the collisional excited lines show that the abundance is around 8.6. We could say that this is one of the most accurate oxygen determinations that exist in the Orion Nebula. And it should be also considered that the dust with oxygen content must be partially destroyed, at least partially destroyed, as, show, as shown by the increase of abundances of iron and nickel that are commonly found in, in dust grains with respect to the, to the nebular values. Therefore, the abundance that we obtain in HH204 has to, be a, has to be greater than that obtained in nebular areas without shocks. However, there are regions in the, in the nebula where the recombination lines predict even 0.1 dex larger abundances. In this sense, the nebular abundances obtained with collisional excited lines are more consistent with the expected uh, scenario. It should be noted that there, there may be differences between the, eight, uh, the abundance discrepancy obtained with oxygen once and oxygen twice uh, ionized uh, recombination lines. So finally, I will give you a preview of what is, uh, what is next, what is uh, being cooked in the oven. And the next target is HH514. Uh, we, are, uh, we estimate a extremely high density. Uh, one of the, the, the biggest ones uh, of 250,000 uh, particles per square centimeter. And it also has a very high degree of ionization with a very uh, a strong radial velocity, very high radial velocity. And we found an extreme dust destruction. The abundances of iron and nickel are close to the solar values. So maybe with this uh, uh, heavy hard object, we are gonna finally complete all the chemical abundances of the Orion Nebula without any ICF and without uh, uncertainties uh, due to the depletion of uh, elements into those grains. So the summary, well, we, I talk so much about, uh, we, I gave a summary already of each component, so we can uh, just say a couple of things. So we are trying to uh, find the chemical composition of the one of the object of, of, of of our goals is to uh, get the chemical composition of the Orion Nebula without any uh, ICFs. And we already made this with helium, argon, carbon, uh, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, sulfur. And with the next target, we may get the chemical composition uh, with, of iron and nickel. And with our analysis, also, we found that uh, the sum of the emission of several objects do not, um, does not always give a representative average uh, value of the present conditions. So we can find this uh, with a more detailed discussion in, in our papers. The first one is already published in, in monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. And the next, and the second one, it uh, was accepted recently in the Astrophysical Journal and it's available already in the AstroPH. 
So uh, to finish, I would like to introduce all the team that is working in, in, this, in, in this series. It's Cesar Esteban from the ISC, William Henney from the IRIA, Jorge Garcia Rojas from the ISC, and Carla that is in the University of Texas. So thank you very much for listening at me. Thanks very much. So let's see some hands for questions. Ah, we have uh, Jesus, go ahead. Jesus, you're okay. muted. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. I am very curious how when you presented and how do you align the images because even the stars in the background are moving. So how do you type, how are you sure that, I mean, it's pretty obvious that the gas is moving, but how, how did you align the images? Because this is one of the main problems when studying very close uh, objects with HSD. Well, this is actually a, a good uh, question to where uh, Will may give us uh, a more light. Yeah, I can, I can, I can answer quickly. They, they, no, they, they are, they're aligned on the stars. That's basically what you use because the proper motion of the stars is known to be have a dispersion of about three or four kilometers a second, which is much smaller than the motions of the gas. So the stars can be considered as almost fixed. So they are they're aligned on to the reference frame of the stars. But the, the movies that, that he was presenting were ones which after, after we calculated the proper motions and we calculated the velocity of the shock, then we re, uh, um, recalculated things in the frame of reference of the shock. Okay, so, so the, the images were put, were the, the, the shot was put deliberately put to be static. Okay. And that way, that way it, take, it removes the main part of the proper motions and means that you can better see any sort of non steady motions uh, in different parts of the shock um, shell. Okay, I hope. So you don't actually the tie the images to the stars, but to the structure of your interest. In. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that was nice. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was taking the average, the average proper motion of the Herbig Hull object and then putting that stationary. Okay, but you do calculate the, the, the expansion rate using the different images. Yes. And, but, but you do so by aligning by the stars and then going backwards. Yes, yes. Everything's calculated by aligning to the frame of the stars. But then okay. that picture was then transformed to the frame of reference, to the average frame of reference of the moving bow shock. Okay. And my next question was like, all of the images were uh, taken with the same camera, like W, that we was WFPC2 camera? No. Uh, okay. No. So, so there is, there is, there are, there is a detail there in that. Um, so they go, they, they, because they cover over 20 years, I'm, I, I shouldn't be, I mean, if someone has another question that's not on this particular topic, it might be better. Uh, but in, in, um, because they cover 20 years, they do cover various cameras and the filters are not all identical. But for this particular application, we took care to, 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 to make sure that we took account of that. Uh, and the actual numbers we calculate are calculated using um, using pairs of images with the same camera. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks, Jesus. Do we have uh, any other questions? Ah, Jane, go ahead. A question from Jane. Um, hi, uh, Eduardo. Could you comment a bit more on the dust destruction? Um, uh, what is assumed about the the initial dust grind? Are they pure iron, or or are they sort of some embedded in some sort of silica or other thing? And uh, sort of what can you determine about a dust destruction rate? Well, uh, until now we just uh, are observing the uh, increase 
of uh, the abundance of some elements as iron and nickel. But we speculate a bit about the increase in oxygen uh, due to the existence of olive, olivines or peroxy or oxides that may be present in, in, in the gas. We expect to have a contribution of oxygen of around 0.1 dex uh, in the total emission of, of the oxygen in the, in the Orion Nebula. So we will expect to have a less depletion in this in these herbic hard objects and an increase up to this value of 0.1 dex more or less. Okay, and how about um, silicates, uh, silicon? Well, we didn't explore that uh, in, in the paper. Uh, I think that we detect several lines of silicon, but uh, I'm not sure if we can determine uh, the abundances of, of, of this. The problem element. with the silicon lines is that they are generally caused by fluorescence and therefore uh, they're not really a direct measurement of the abundance of the uh, of the element. You you possibly could get silic silicon abundances, but it would require complicated radiative transfer modeling that would have lots of uncertainties. So it can't it can't be determined as directly as it can with collisional lines. Okay, so the the possible in, um, increased abundance in the iron would be from destruction of of sort of grain molecules in which there was iron but not necessarily pure iron grains. That's no, 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 it's um, a molecular, uh, a destruction of some molecules. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jane. Do we have another question? Uh, Luis Zapata, go ahead. You're muted. Uh, okay, there we go. Now is now. Uh, thanks yeah. for the talk. I think it's really beautiful images that you present. I, my question is about the, I mean, existing sources of these objects. I work a little bit with William in this regard, and I don't know if you have a really nice now candidates that are really exciting these objects. I mean. Mainly the Pi 29. This is sort of a beautiful, I mean, object. And the other one, the HHS 204. Well, well, yes, uh, both are uh, exit, uh, well, ionized by, by the stars of, of the potassium. In fact, mm -hmm. the, what, what we see is that the ionization from HH204 comes from, from the back. From from the towards the direction of uh, theta ori one c. Maybe Luis is talking about the the source the of the jet. Yes. The source I, of the outflow. Ah, the source Not of the, the outflow. Source oh, of the radiation. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, I, I couldn't. I didn't understand that. Well, it's uh, from HH uh, five hundred twenty nine. We didn't like actually find, uh, or we didn't try to get. Uh, the, a possible origin, but it is likely that it comes from the Orion South because it, it's, it looks that it comes directly from this direction. And from HH204, we found uh, a filament of gas that seems to fit HH204 from the Orion South, from the South part of the Orion South, but it is not completely clear. Uh, there is uh, like a lot of, uh, I think I have the, the, the image. Yeah, it seems, it is possible to come from here, but it is not. It's not completely uh, like proof. And on the other hand, from HH two hundred and three, uh, we can see actually two uh, flows of gas that it's feeding this superposition of two of two flows. Okay, it's not really clear where it's really coming. The, yeah, the yeah. problem is not is not lack of candidates. The problem is too many candidates. Yes. Yeah, the resources. Really, really. <laughs> uh -huh. no okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Luis. Maybe one more question. Anyone?
If not, let us thank our speaker again. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll get in touch with you to ask for a copy of your talk. Okay, thank you, thank you. Are you gonna upload it or, or something? Yeah. Okay. With your permission. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, thanks a lot and uh, thank you everyone. Gracias, Eduardo. Hasta luego. Hasta luego.